Let's kick this session off with a question. What is the one thing that you think you need in your life to be absolutely happy? I only start us off with that question because it's one thing for the acceptance and approval of God to be a great idea in our lives, but it's another thing for it to be a completely different and dominating beast in our life. Uh, the second part of the gospel prayer says this, Jesus, you are all I need today for everlasting joy. You may not realize this, but your heart loves to worship idols. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, dude, I don't have any idols in my house. I don't have a gold statue that I burn incense to and I bow to every night and worship and go hum to. You may be right. You probably don't have something like that in your home. But the reason that you don't think you have idols is because you don't really understand what worship is. See, you worship what you think gives you value or worth. You worship the thing that you think you need for complete happiness and joy. Right now, where you're sitting, I want you to look around at your friends and I want you to say this word, kabod. Go ahead, say it, kabod. If you're not hawking a loogie up on your neighbor, you're probably not saying it correctly. Kabod. It's the Hebrew word for glory. It literally means weight. To give something glory in your life is to worship it. It's to put so much weight upon it that you couldn't imagine life without it. An idol isn't necessarily a bad thing. It could be a good thing that you're actually putting God-type weight in. And the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 25 says it like this. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served something created instead of the creator. Another way we can say that is we've begun to worship the gifts and not the giver. Uh, you know, um, maybe you've made a statement like this in your life, if you're anything like me. Uh, God, I know you're good, but if you would just give me blank, I promise I'll do whatever it is you want me to do. Now, what's in that blank? Was it maybe uh, give me a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Athletic uh, status? Uh, maybe it was fame or popularity on your campus. Maybe it was academic success. Whatever it is that you had in that blank, if it wasn't Jesus, that is what you have allowed to become your idol. A guy by the name of Christian Smith says this about teenagers. He did a big research project on the landscape of spirituality among American teenagers, and this is what he came up with. He said this, American teenagers see God more of as a divine butler who was actually created and existing to meet their needs. You ever done that before? You looked at God as if he was there to serve you. Hey God, I could use a little bit more of this here. Or God, I could use a little bit more of that here. God, can you do this for me? God, can you do that for me? See what happens in that moment is you put yourself at the center of the universe. But the truth of the scripture is this, is that you and me, we were created to love, to serve and to worship God. We were created for him he was not created for us. Now, don't get me wrong. We are all varsity level worshipers. That switch, it never gets turned off in our lives. It's just that often our worship is misguided. You see this in our life and you see it constantly in the scripture. We see this in Exodus 32 when Moses goes up to the mountain to meet with God. Moses had been the one who was constantly pointing the hearts and minds of the people of God back to him. So when Moses disappears and he goes up on the mountain to meet with God, he's up there for a while and the people of Israel panic. So what do they do? They set up for themselves an idol. And when they set that idol up, they literally began to bow down and worship it. Now, how could the people of God do such a thing? Think about their history. They had seen God deliver them from slavery in Egypt. They had been oppressed for years. God delivered them. Not only did he deliver him, but when they showed up to the Red Sea on the shore, God parted the waters and they walked across on dry land. Now that's a, that's a cool like Bible story that we hear growing up, but like imagine walking up to the water's edge, standing there, the waves hitting your feet, and then all of a sudden God parts the water and the ground is dry and you walk across. And then when they're freed and they're wandering in the wilderness, God actually provides for them and sustains them. He gives them water from rocks and he gives them manna from the sky. That's crazy. How could you ever forget such a thing? So you hear that and you think, well, how does the pursuit of idols in my life cease? Well, the answer is the pursuit 
the love and affection of idols only decreases when the glory and pursuit of God increases in your life. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 says this, But you, man of God, run from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Now listen, if you only flee, but you're not pursuing something greater, you only get a better morality. You're just religious. Jesus isn't after a better morality. He's after the affections of your heart. The affections of your heart for Jesus become greater when the gospel becomes greater. Jesus is better than anything that you had in that blank. He's better than the approval of man. He's better than the fame and success in your school. He's better than the relationship that you desire with someone else. All of those things, they are to give you a taste of the beauty, love, and acceptance of God. Jesus is all you need today for everlasting joy.